So good um, morning, afternoon, or evening to all of you. Um, we have 35 participants already, so um, we're going to go ahead and start. Um, my name is Monica Kramer. I am the treasurer for the Periodic Paralysis Association. I just want to let everyone know that this is being recorded, and it will um, be located on our YouTube channel at a later date. So if there's any information that's on here, you will be able to retrieve it later. Um, we at the PPA are very happy to partner with Zaris today to bring you our live Ask, Ask the Ex Expert today with Dr. Cannon. So welcome, Dr. Cannon. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. And we're gonna get started. Um, we have quite a few people, but before we get started, I wanted to let everybody know that we're going to try to um, spend time on three popular topics um, and save the last 15 minutes for the rare questions. That way, if we don't get to your question, hopefully um, one of the other person's answers will um, be able to answer your question for you. We also ask that you limit your question to one minute so that we can get in many as many questions as possible when you're asking those questions. And the way you can ask those questions is through the chat that's located um, on your screen, or you can raise your hand and I can um, ask, access you. All right, so let's see. I have Mary Ann who has raised her hand. Let me see how I can see. to find Mary Ann here. We have a lot of people today. Or if you want to start with your the chat there, Dr. Cannon, that came in. Okay, and I, I see folks are using the chat and the Q&A simultaneously, which is fine. We can look at either one. Okay. Um, so I have uh, one on the chat from Ramona who says, I've had periodic paralysis uh, episodes for the last few years, now 59 years old, along with a number of other health issues. They've increased as time goes on and my worst one was 40 hours long. I've been abused in ERs when the medical personnel think I'm faking it and can really uh, come around um, if they apply enough painful stimuli. So I try to avoid that. My PP gene panel was negative. However, my husband recently uh, tried giving me an extra 10 milligram milliequivalents of potassium pill when I had episodes, been on prescription potassium previously, um, and it resolved the episodes. My neurologist is happy to prescribe potassium and take as needed, thankfully. In a nutshell, is it possible to have hypokalemic periodic paralysis with a negative PP gene panel? So the short answer is yes. Um, so currently, probably about 80% of individuals who have a compelling clinical presentation that is consistent with hypo-PP, that means characteristic episodes of weakness that are recurrent, uh, sometimes in association with low potassium, they do not have myotonia, it may run in the family. In about 80% of those cases, the gene panel will come back positive. But uh, many of us are convinced there are, there are other causes out there or reasons why the panel has come back negative. So that doesn't absolutely exclude the diagnosis. If you or your healthcare providers are looking for additional uh, objective evidence for periodic paralysis, the uh, exercise test, the CMAP exercise test is another way uh, to provide objective evidence that your muscles are different from other persons and that you're at risk for periodic paralysis. So that is an outpatient test that neurologists can perform. Um, the sensitivity isn't uh, fantastic. It's around 60 or 70%. But if there's an abnormal result um, that is consistent with periodic paralysis, uh, that's a very strong uh, piece of supporting evidence. So uh, I wish you luck on your journey. You're not alone. A lot of people um, are in this situation where many things are consistent, uh, but the gene test um, doesn't show uh, an abnormality. Uh, we can go, uh, I'll go to Mary's question. Is there a relationship 
uh, between periodic paralysis and restless leg syndrome. Um, they both affect uh, mobility in different ways, but there is no um, relationship. Um, so um, one might have both conditions, uh, sometimes lightning strikes twice, uh, but the restless leg syndrome is um, uh, caused by other um, problems not related to periodic paralysis. Uh, hi, uh, this is from uh, Sian. I live in uh, Australia and I'm clinically diagnosed hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. I wanna know if there's any way I'm able to participate in the research you're doing uh, from here as there's really nothing happening in terms of the research that I can be a part of. Well, Sean, thanks for uh, volunteering. Um, one of the ways that um, everybody can be involved that really helps me as someone who's spent 30 years of my career investigating periodic paralysis is to hear your stories. And that's why I really love going to the PPA meetings or having events like this uh, where I can hear firsthand because um, that's the best data. It's, it's far better than reading um, the summary synopsis even in a medical textbook or article. We all try to do our best job of accurately reporting uh, what we learn from uh, affected individuals, but sometimes in an effort to sort of lump things together and create a consistent description, the story gets changed a little bit. So first of all, it helps our research efforts uh, to hear how this uh, affects you and learning about your triggers and, and what the course over your life has been. Um, for some individuals in whom a specific uh, genetic uh, anomaly has been identified. Um, in certain cases, we're able to work through those in the laboratory. It's very low throughput. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about that at the PPA meeting uh, next week. Um, it takes about three months of uh, continuous effort by uh, a, a scientist to functionally study the consequences of a particular mutation. But um, I'm delighted to stay connected with, to this community and to the extent possible, we're happy to involve all of you in any, any of our research uh, activities. Uh, thank you so much. I have a son with similar episodes. Oh, Ramona's getting back to us. Okay. Um, I see just the beginning of the name. It's been cut off, but hello, Dr. Cannon. Hello, everyone else. I'm from Hamburg, Germany, uh, 70 years old. I have periodic paralysis since I was born. How these paralyses are classified is still not very clear. I received my first diagnosis in 1998, hyper PP. Almost all the symptoms I can describe uh, certainly fit with this. Number one, there are predominantly short attacks of paralysis. Uh, and then there are single muscle groups, uh, which were strongly stressed at one moment during paralysis. Secondly, during paralysis attacks, there's a significantly increased level of blood potassium up to 4.5 to, uh, to 7.5 millimoles per liter. That's definitely high. Uh, oral potassium intake practically always triggers a tendency to paralysis. Uh, the occurrence of paralysis can always be prevented or interrupted uh, by movement of all muscles. A slight uh, light workout breaks the best. Um, long lasting paralysis and tending, uh, tendencies to paralysis occur in case of carbohydrate rich diet. This all points to hyper PP as far as I can see. Um, so I certainly agree. A lot of those features are uh, uh, typical for hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. In fact, that's one of the clearest stories I've recently heard. So um, without knowing specifics of results of gene testing, I would suggest that you manage this. Um, as hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Um, the one thing um, that was a little atypical in your case was the very last point that the carbohydrate rich meals are a problem for you. Uh, most people with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis find just the opposite, that fasting is a problem or potassium rich foods would be a problem. But that carbohydrate rich meals or taking a snack, eating a candy bar, can be helpful at the, if you feel the onset of an attack that's about to happen. That's because um, sugars and carbohydrates, uh, when they enter the bloodstream, uh, they promote uptake of sugar and potassium into cells, the liver and muscle, 
and this helps reduce the potassium, which is helpful for individuals with hyper PP, but obviously is contraindicated in hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So this illustrates the importance of having a clear diagnosis. And yes, you started out your questions. There are many types of periodic paralysis, the two major being uh, hypokalemic periodic paralysis and hyperkalemic. If, um, I think the second part, she did include her genetic tests. Okay, uh, they Fullerton they Lab T704F. Yeah, okay, so you have uh, threonine 704 methionine. This is one of the uh, most prevalent uh, missense mutations that's been recognized in hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. It's been studied extensively in our lab and others, Frank Lehman Horn in Germany and his colleagues, for example, and uh, Karen Jorkot Rott. And there's no question that this is um, a pathogenic variant. So it alters the function of the channel. It allows uh, too much sodium current. It puts the muscle fiber at risk of excessive depolarization, which causes the episodes of weakness but also um, for myotonia. So I didn't see in your particular story, but um, many patients with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis will also have episodes of involuntary after contraction and muscle stiffness. This fluctuates over time and with level of physical activity, uh, but in many individuals, the myotonia becomes more pronounced just before an attack of weakness. Uh, so if you're experiencing all of that, that's entirely consistent um, with uh, your diagnosis and this particular pathogenic variant. Okay, I'll move on to uh, Julie's question. Uh, do you have any insight about the effects on uh, hormones in periodic paralysis, specifically during the puberty years and also circadian rhythms and seasonal changes? I have two teenage boys with periodic paralysis and both have had major issues during the years uh, 11 to 13. My current 13 year old uh, is currently waking up in an episode every day and it lasts until about uh, 10 p.m. when he finally gets full strength uh, just to wake up in an episode again the next day. Uh, this is the third year of this. In previous years and during the summer, he would have less severe episodes which resolved uh, with FRK uh, but it doesn't help when he wakes up paralyzed. The same thing happened um, uh, with my now 16 year old, but he has been doing much better in the years since um, growth slowed. So terrific questions, a lot of information there. Um, this um, story is consistent with hypokalemic periodic paralysis in terms of the fact that uh, there's improvement with potassium and the fact that the first severe episodes were around the time of puberty. That's one of the differences that's often seen between hypokalemic periodic paralysis, where the attacks tend to come a little later in life around puberty, as contrasted with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, where in young childhood, uh, some of the first attacks uh, can be recognized. There are a lot of interesting endocrine connections. So puberty is one of them, as you mentioned. Another is gender. So women with hypokalemic periodic paralysis, especially due to missense mutations of the calcium channel, so the very commonly occurring R528 mutation, in many cases, the women who inherit this trait in the family have very mild episodes of uh, temporary transient weakness. But unfortunately, they may still develop the late onset permanent weakness in their 30s and 40s. So they're still impacted by the disorder, but they don't have as severe um, um, episodic attacks. Interestingly, we've made genetically engineered mouse models of that type of periodic paralysis, the calcium channel R528H, and the female mice do not have as severe attacks as the male mice. So clearly there are many, many hormonal issues. There are changes in the pattern with menses, with menopause, with pregnancy. So yes, there's a lot of uh, connections there, um, but um, 
it's still at a stage where we're trying to connect the dots and understand exactly why. And what would be fantastic if we could get a better understanding of mechanism here is to use this to guide uh, future interventions. So, you know, gee, isn't it wonderful that many women are not bothered by severe episodic attacks? If, if we could understand why and, and then use that to help men, that would be, that would be terrific. Um, so it's a very robust observation. And I hope your two boys um, things settle down for them um, as they get older. Um, but the episodes in the morning in particular, very classic uh, for hypo-PP. I should give others a, a chance with their questions. Uh, so I think this might be Sean again, but I'll see. Uh, I guess it's responding to my answer. Okay, is there a way I can video chat because I can't attend the conference? I have no known gene mutations uh, and he's had uh, whole genome sequencing. So. Monica, you can correct me, but I think in some of the panel discussions on Sunday morning, there'll be a chance for remote questions. Um, it's going to be through Zoom again, um, but what she can do or they can do is um, if they want to contact either myself or Linda through the website, if they do not have access through the Zoom, we can, uh, and again, very selectively have email <laughs> questions. <laughs> so only if you cannot um, get through to the Zoom, like this person here in Australia, um, you can send it to us and we will do our best to get you those questions to you. But yeah, there is no, there is the, the, the platform is the same. Um, and it's also, I believe, going to be through YouTube. So they could also ask questions through YouTube if this platform is too difficult for them. Okay. And finally, uh, if you submit a question to ask the expert on the PPA site, um, Linda and Monica do a terrific job of sort of triaging those to try to find the person who can do the best at answering the question. And if it comes to me, I'll be happy to answer. So that's another option. Um, I'll go on uh, with the chat. Monica, if, if there are topics that you want to specifically hit, just interrupt me and we can, we can switch gears, however. Um, well, did you want to take one through the question and answer the Q&A? Sure. Um, um, yeah, I shouldn't just stick with one format. <laughs> so <laughs> um, a question on the Q&A, uh, what is the best way to determine when to exercise and how to rest uh, for periodic paralysis benefit? And what is happening when we exercise that make us feel good, better, worse? Um, let me start with that question first. Great question. So exercise and level of uh, muscular activity is very intimately related to the fluctuating uh, episodes of periodic paralysis. So interestingly, in the two major forms of periodic paralysis, both hypokalemic and hyperkalemic, Resting after vigorous exercise is a very common trigger factor. It's one of the most common triggers that we see reported over and over again. So in a typical scenario, um, this would occur after prolonged high intensity exercise. So, you know, playing a full game of, of basketball or, you know, a 45 minute cardio workout on an exercise bicycle or something like this. Curiously, a very characteristic feature is the weakness doesn't occur during exercise. So we think in the laboratory, there are, there are adaptive changes going on in muscle during vigorous exercise that is protecting you. The risk period comes after stopping. And in particularly, if you abruptly stop, and like sit down on a couch or lie down, then usually within 10 or 15 minutes, you could have a really severe episode and have difficulty standing up and things like that. So, um, you know, a lot of individuals with periodic paralysis say, well, does this mean exercise programs are out for me or I can't participate in sports? And I would say you have to, uh, Taper, tailor that to the individual. So many, many can participate in sports. I think Monica's riding horses competitively again. So we certainly don't want the message to go out that you shouldn't be active. Physical activity is good for you. But I would warm up slowly. If you have hypo PP, make sure you're well hydrated before. 
So hydration is important. Hydration can make you pee, of course. So if you need potassium supplementation, you might do that as well before the exercise. But then another key strategy is when you're finished with the activity, warm down. So spend 10 or 15 minutes taking a walk or, or moving. Don't just stop and remain motionless because that's a high risk behavior to trigger an attack. Similarly, individuals with either hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis who may have an impending attack independent of exercise, might be just spontaneous or from diet or you wake up with an episode, many individuals find that light exercise can um, accelerate their recovery or prevent the attack from getting worse. So don't be confused and think, oh, exercise is a trigger. I shouldn't exercise if I'm starting to get weak. So you have to be, you know, think about this a little bit because light exercise can be helpful. So we think some of the same things that are protecting you during vigorous exercise come into play during light exercise. So you can use that uh, to try to prevent an attack. It's a very interesting question scientifically. We're working on it in the lab. Uh, again, we have genetically engineered uh, mouse models that we're using to explore this. One clue is definitely the acid-base balance that occurs in exercising muscle. And we've been able to confirm that um, in the mice. Uh, and we've been able to confirm the scientific basis for this warm down after exercise. So this is a very consistent observation from individuals. And um, I, I would really uh, re recommend this if you're having a problem with exercise-induced attacks. Um, the second question is how can we tell when we've taken enough or too much potassium? So this is a great um, question. Um, there would have to be extreme levels of potassium uh, before you will feel it symptomatically. And if it's gotten to that point, you actually need to go to the emergency room. Um, um, in a healthy individual with normally functioning kidneys, Fortunately, with the rate of absorption from oral potassium administration, usually the kidneys will um, um, carefully eliminate excessive potassium in the urine or it'll be taken up um, in parts of the body. You know, there are general guidelines based on your body size and total milli equivalents per day, you know, so roughly one milli equivalent per kilogram, uh, things like that you're gonna be um, okay with. It's a frequent, uh, topic at the PPA meetings, well, what about these devices to detect potassium from saliva or, or other uh, through the skin and things like that? And you have to be careful with that. Um, you know, I, I'm not confident of the accuracy of those yet to push things to the limit. So, you know, use moderation, think about the total dose um, and, and, and be careful about um, taking too much because what will happen in, in, in addition to that impacting your muscle strength is your heart, the regularity of your heartbeat is very sensitive to too much or too little potassium. And you can make a mistake in either direction. So certainly if you're feeling lightheaded or faint or your heartbeat is irregular, go to the emergency room. Um, you, you need to have it, it checked right there. Um, but you can't, you can't safely you know, dose yourself in, 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 until you, you're, you're feeling a potassium effect other than on a slow time course of many minutes to a half an hour and so forth. I'm trying to minimize uh, the effect of an attack of weakness or something like that. And um, so be careful. Um, you know, potassium can be relatively safe, um, uh, but, but people can fall into a trap of escalating doses and, and you just don't wanna harm yourself. So I'm seeing some questions with people who do not have any confirmed genetic diagnosis. So I'm hoping that this question that I'll ask will help a lot of people. Um, so when we are clinically diagnosed, not genetically diagnosed, um, I, I believe we covered some, you covered some of this in one of the docu-series episodes. Um, it appears that a lot of people are usually diagnosed clinically with hypo. Um, so when you're taking potassium daily and you don't have a 
genetic diagnosis, you should still, I, I, I lived this my life, right? Um, like I have someone here that is clinically diagnosed and is taking potassium. They really need to be careful though too, right? Yes, so um, these are all great questions. Um, so let me start by reminding everyone that in hypokalemic periodic paralysis, uh, even in the setting of an established, uh, you know, absolutely classic gene defect, your body does not have a problem holding on potassium or, to, or losing potassium in the urine. You can have, your episodes of weakness may be associated with an inappropriate shift of potassium into the muscle, inside the muscle cell, but your total body potassium is normal. And, you're, and, and that's why you've got to be careful of overshoot. So, you know, even for well-intended physicians, if you go to the emergency room with a severe attack of weakness um, and you have low potassium because it's shifted into your muscle, the first response is going to be, oh, we have to administer a lot of potassium and I'm really worried I'm going to even do this intravenously and there can be overshoots. So that's one caution of potassium. But getting back to the question, it's equally safe for a person with clinically diagnosed hypopp or genetically confirmed hypopp to use potassium supplements because both of those categories will handle potassium levels in the body and regulating it by kidney and other mechanisms it's going to be equivalent um, because that's independent uh, of, of the gene defect so um, you know it's i would say especially you know there are different levels of clinically diagnosed periodic paralysis without a gene confirmation. So in some cases, um, it can be kind of thin ice because only one person in the family is affected. The attacks are a little unusual in terms of their frequency or age of onset or what your triggers are. And, and so it might be, you know, this might be periodic. And, and there are other clinically diagnosed situations where you know, five of my relatives have this. It's an also dominant pattern. We have absolutely classic attacks. Uh, many times we wake up weak. I'm clearly benefited by potassium. If I eat a lot of carbohydrates, it triggers an attack. Those are absolutely classical features of periodic paralysis. And so the confidence level of a clinical diagnosis is, is over a spectrum. So the level of enthusiasm that your physician may have for prescribing potassium could depend on the confidence level of that clinical diagnosis. And so again, it has to be nuanced a bit for uh, individuals. So I'm, I'm scanning the questions, trying to pick ones that seem to be pretty common. Um, one of them is also, is it common to have abnormal EMG tests when you have periodic paralysis? Okay, that's a terrific question. So EMG stands for electromyogram. This is a test of the electrical activity of your muscles that um, a neurologist or um, someone in physical therapy might do. And we use this uh, for two primary reasons in periodic paralysis. One is the exercise test, um, uh, the CMAP exercise test that might also be called the McManus test. Dr. McManus was the first one to write about this and popularize it. In this test, what we're looking for is whether the excitability of a muscle, usually testing a small muscle in your hand, whether that electrical excitability becomes compromised after voluntary exercise. So they hook up the surface electrodes, no needles. It's an easier test. They apply a little mild shock to the nerve, uh, so it, it causes um, a synchronized, um, forceful contraction of the muscle in your hand. We can measure the electrical activity of that, and that tells us how well your muscle is functioning in terms of its uh, electrical properties. Then um, you have voluntary exercise for one to five minutes, and then they, they follow the excitability over an hour. So that test, um, in about 60 or 70% of individuals with periodic paralysis will be abnormal. The excitability will begin to fail after this exercise. So that is extremely helpful in establishing a clinical diagnosis because as all of you out there know, in between attacks, 
many individuals have completely normal function. There can be permanent late onset weakness we'll talk about in another part I'm sure this morning. But um, for those with the episodic attacks only, you are normal in between attacks. And so there's nothing for the neurologist to see and help objectively make the diagnosis. So that's one EMG test. The second is the so-called needle electromyogram where a small needle is inserted to the muscle. This is where you hear the loud clicks. Um, you contract the muscle voluntarily you hear it's as the, the uh, amplified signal is played through a speaker. This test is very helpful in periodic paralysis to look for myotonia. So myotonia is the term clinicians use for the involuntary after contraction of muscle because muscle is electrically irritable or too excitable. This can be an accompaniment of hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, not hypo, hyper or normal kalemic as well. So if myotonia is identified, again, that's very helpful to your, uh, your medical care providers because it's objective evidence that your muscles are not normal. And so this can really help you say, you know, I've got something going on here. I'm not faking it. This is not stress. This is not <laughs> psychosomatic. There is something. So this is how EMG can be helpful. And the second way is if you have myotonia, then from my perspective, you do not have hypo. You need to be thinking about hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. So for those reasons, it's a very useful test. And that will be the perfect segue into this next question. This person, um, John, um, he has potassium aggravates his myotonia. Um, he has, um, but he's noticed that when he takes sodium, it can resolve the myotonia. Um, his mutations are in the KCNJ18 and RYR1 mutation, but he does not have hyperthy uh, hyperthyroid but high, carb high carbohydrate meals cause weakness, but no myotonia. Um, and then also potassium helps with heat intolerance and weakness, but always causes myotonia unless taken with salt. So by, and, and there's more descriptive details in here, but that kind of sounds like what you just described, the myotonia and the potassium aggravating, it's more likely this person may have hyper. Yeah, uh, so there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> um, uh, and so the gene results that were mentioned are actually inconsistent with potassium aggravated myotonia and not related to myotonia. Um, so potassium aggravated myotonia uh, is actually refers to a sodium channel mutation in individuals who have myotonia and actually do not have episodes of weakness. Um, and, um, but it's the same channel that's affected in hyper PP and paramyotonia congenita. So if you have myotonic stiffness, either symptomatically or by EMG, and you have episodes of weakness, you may have paramyotonia congenita or you may have hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, um, but potassium aggravated myotonia would be the wrong term to use. I know there are a lot of terms out there and, and, and people with paramyotonia congenita can have their potassium, uh, can have their myotonia aggravated by potassium. I think Monica can tell you about that. <laughs> so, um, so I know the terms seem to make sense when you put them together, but potassium aggravated myotonia was a very special term used to describe a special class of sodium channel mutation. So interestingly, you measured, you mentioned um, the gene test panel came back with variants in KCNJ18 and the ryanidine receptor. So KCNJ18 is a possible unusual association with thyrotoxic periodic paralysis. Um, so it would be important to know that your thyroid status is normal um, and it's an elevated hyperactive thyroid that can put you at risk for a form of periodic paralysis that looks a lot like hypokalemic periodic paralysis. But just to be clear, 
the thyrotoxic periodic paralysis does not have myotonia. They did the, mention that they don't have hyperthyroid. Okay, yeah, which is, which is great. So that's where the KCNJ18 uh, comes from. The RYR1, that's the ryanidine receptor. This is a very important part of skeletal muscle and heart and, and actually other tissues. The ryanidine receptor releases calcium inside cells. So things that you need to do like contraction of your muscle or beating of your heart or things a lot of other cells to do, um, a ryanidine receptor is important for that. The ryanidine receptor uh, is a huge protein. It has a huge gene. It just increases the likelihood of these variants cropping up there. And we haven't talked about variants of unknown significance and things like that, which is a big part of gene testing. One of the, there's a real challenge in interpreting the consequence of finding a variant in the ryanidine receptor. Because it's so big, because it's associated with so many muscle disorders, um, so central core disease, congenital myopathy, malignant hyperthermia, it's actually the very rare individual with a ryanidine receptor variant who has periodic paralysis. In fact, if you look really critically at the literature, there are four cases in the entire world's literature out of the group in London where there's a convincing association between a ryanidine receptor variant and periodic paralysis. So it needs to be on the panel. We need to learn more about it, but it's a very, very rare cause of, of typical periodic paralysis. Myopathy, sure. Possible fluctuating weakness, sure. But not a classical periodic paralysis phenotype uh, with a ryanidine receptor feature. And, and we're getting quite a few questions about permanent muscle weakness. Um, one is, uh, that they have permanent, permanent muscle weakness or it's starting to progress. And if there's anything that they can do to slow it down, the other is um, they don't, they're in their sixties and their doctor that they're seeing believes that since they're in their sixties already, they're probably not going to get um, a great deal of muscle weakness. Um, and is that accurate? Is that an accurate statement for their doctor to make? Okay. So permanent Muscle weakness um, is an integral part of, of periodic paralysis, both hypo and hyper. And uh, ever since physicians first recognized the syndrome and, and followed families, uh, they've been aware of the fact that particularly with advancing age, individuals shift from having episodic attacks to having prolonged attacks and then mild weakness that is is permanent. And uh, often this affects the, the proximal muscles. So uh, the large muscles of the leg that are important for like getting up out of a chair or walking up a flight of stairs. Um, and in some individuals, uh, it can become severe enough to affect ambulation um, and either needing an assist device or in some cases, uh, even a wheelchair. And so as soon as we learned more about these diseases and the gene defects began to be identified. We were very curious to see, well, are there certain mutations that put you at higher risk and so forth? And the answer is uh, no, any, any one of the recognized mutations, uh, you can be at risk for this. It happens in both hypo and hyper. Some series where um, clinical investigators have done natural history studies and they've looked at large numbers of families and relied not only on self-perception and reporting of permanent weakness, but manual muscle testing and have physiatrist measure strength, estimate that up to 80% up to of individuals with periodic paralysis will at some form and time in their life develop this permanent weakness. So you need to also be aware that a, a feature of periodic paralysis is instead of brief attacks lasting a couple of hours or a day or more, many individuals can sort of be in a slump where for a couple of weeks or a month, their muscle performance is not what it previously had been. And fortunately that can be reversible. It can be reversible um, by taking better care of yourself, diet, sometimes um, going on a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor can pull someone out of that. So please 
work with your physician and understand that even if you've had a prolonged problem with, with impaired muscle function, it might not necessarily be permanent weakness. And that's very important uh, to explore. But permanent weakness is another part of this disease. There are anatomic changes that happen in the fibers that you can see on biopsy. A, a really um, perplexing uh, feature of this disease is we have not been able to make clear correlations between who is at risk of permanent weakness in terms of frequency of the transient attacks or severity of the transient attacks or gender or specific mutation. It's been very frustrating that we haven't been able to pull apart clear correlations so that we would know how to advise into people and say, oh, I'm sorry, but this is one of the cases where we know it's going to be a problem or, hey, don't worry, you're, you're going to be in a better risk category. It really isn't clear yet. What I, what I would say and what makes good sense is take care of yourself. Try to minimize the number of attacks you have, the frequency of attacks. There are a lot of big changes, not only in the electrical activity, but uh, things moving in and out of muscle, water shifts, swelling. There's a lot of wear and tear on the muscle that occurs with these episodes. And just uh, it just makes sense to try to um, you know, preserve muscle function and, and take care of yourself. So right now, um, the best advice we have is, is things to minimize uh, the episodic attacks, um, try to remain mobile. Immobility is a big problem for muscle function. So especially with people in advanced age, do not you know, throw in the towel and say, you know, forget it, I'm just gonna stay on the couch. That's not good for you either. You need to be safe. Work with the occupational or physical therapist to see if you need assist devices to, uh, to be safe or family members. Make sure you don't have you know, throw rugs or things you can trip over and, and issues uh, around your home. Um, so that's a very long-winded answer, but permanent muscle weakness um, is a frustrating issue um, that, um, uh, again, just doing things that make sense is, is where we can take it uh, for the time being. This is one of the motivators. We'll get into this in the conference, maybe not too much time left this morning about gene therapies and things like that, because really that might be the greatest opportunity uh, to try to make an impact on the, on the permanent weakness, which, which I know weighs heavily on everyone's mind. And I did share some links um, in the chat for where you can go to look at your VUS, um, what the current information is, and then also for people who are looking for genetic testing. Um, here in the United States, that link um, is for American citizens. Uh, it's at no cost. Um, but one of the questions that we see a lot of is, what do they do if they can't find a physician that is willing to even sign them up for this? I mean, it sounds crazy to me. It's at no cost, but people are still having problems getting physicians to fill up this paperwork for them. Is there any other avenues for them to get genetic testing? Yeah, so um, I will have to acknowledge that I have not personally tried to you know, see what Invite, the company who performs the test, will do if there's a patient initiated. I think part of the issue is for, you know, uh, the generous support by Xeris to cover the cost. Uh, there needs to be, you know, some kind of um, control over the number of requests. It could just get a little overwhelming uh, if it didn't come with a physician's request. So I think that's where that comes from for the Uncovering Periodic Paralysis uh, sponsored program. Um, you, could, you could test with a check with the company, though. I think if you're willing to pay out of pocket, they, they may offer it. Other individuals um, have, uh, there's been a lot of um, noise out there in social media and some of it has come through the PPA website. What about uh, you know, Ancestry or 23andMe and other gene panels because they're now releasing uh, you know, SNPs and, and variants and things like that. So you can be a little bit of a detective uh, and, and look for that, but uh, I would say it's better to go uh, you know, with a CLIA approved, uh, you know, American Board of Clinical Pathology accredited laboratory, uh, rather than uh, relying on those other events. And, um, 
you know, I think you'll be able to find uh, a clinician who'll be willing to help you with this. You know, part of it is we try to be uh, cost conscious. I mean, it's a big challenge, especially in the United States. There's only so much out there in terms of uh, the entire healthcare system and what can, we can afford. And, and physicians, you know, they don't want to withhold treatment or diagnostic opportunities for individuals, but they're just trying to use their best judgment to contain cost. And that's where this is usually coming from. Yes. And, and I think there are other answer, um, answers Sarah's question about a tax. Um, basically, they were their last question is, does the palpitations have anything to do with the PP condition, periodic paralysis condition? When you're in an attack, um, can you have- I'm sorry, I mean, did you say complications or palpitations? Palpitations. I, I, yeah. So this is a, actually a really wonderful question. Um, so first of all, um, because of the shifts in potassium in and out of muscle and the changes in the blood levels of potassium, there can be secondary changes in the heart. And so people with a normal heart, even though the, the periodic paralysis genes, except for anderson Well syndrome, but in hyper and hypokalemic periodic paralysis, those genes are not expressed in the heart. And so you, you do not have an intrinsic risk of arrhythmia. You can have a secondary problem because the electrolytes get so far aligned. So some individuals may experience uh, palpitations or a change in heart rate uh, with an episode. If that is persistent or you feel lightheaded, that's when you need to go to the emergency room. But it also brings up a good point is you may have uh, members in your family who have episodic weakness that's consistent with periodic paralysis. Um, and maybe you have unexplained fainting spells or skipped heartbeats. Um, and maybe your family tends to be short stature or you have curved fingers or um, low set ears or wide set eyes. This is Anderson to Will syndrome. And um, you need to have this evaluated, uh, especially by a cardiologist as well as a neurologist. So if you have a combination of self-perceived irregular heartbeat and periodic paralysis, make sure someone has addressed the question of whether this might be Anderson to Will syndrome. Um, and Dr. To Will is gonna be at the PPA meeting next week. So there's an opportunity for follow up on that. Yes, he'll be online presenting and available for questions. Um, so someone, uh, John wrote in about why does salt help myotonia symptoms? Because it works for him as well as the other person that mentioned that. Yeah, so um, uh, the short answer is uh, it, it's unknown, but uh, several people have reported this. And I just want um, all the viewers out there to be a little bit uh, careful because I've heard two stories now if I've kept track where salt like potato chips table salt is helping individuals with myotonia I think that's how it was described because on the other side with hypokalemic periodic paralysis salt sodium table salt high salt foods can be a problem so be careful about there about supplementing um, with salt to treat any type of periodic paralysis and everything in between. Uh, so I would never argue with somebody who has, um, you know, found out on their own that something helps them. That's terrific. If it's reasonably safe, if you don't have high blood pressure, if you're not taking crazy amounts of salt, that's fine and that's good and, you know, share it with others. Um, but I will say there's good uh, scientific data, and it happens in our, in our mouse models. In our mouse models, if I make the salt, the sodium too high, they'll get an attack of paralysis. So, and, and patients have recorded this as well. So be careful with the table salt story. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm one that I have to, I'm, for some reason, when I go into an episode, I crave salt and, and sugar. Um, we have some questions coming in about the RYR1 gene mutation. Um, can You had already touched base on that a little bit. Um, and it seems to be that some of these people are diagnosed as hypo or uh, clinically diagnosed as hypo or and hyper. Um, is, are these clinical diagnosis, can they both be correct? No. If it's... 
Yeah, so great question. So in both the situation of those rare RYR1 cases and in Anderson to Will syndrome, actually, the relationship with potassium is a little murky. It's not as clear as hypo and hyper. And there's a whole nother situation, which is normal chelemic periodic paralysis, which I'll just put the quick plug out, which I feel is a variant of hyper. But um, for these other gene defects that can be associated with fluctuating weakness, sometimes it's not directly in relation to a change in the potassium level and can happen independent of the potassium level or in inconsistent ways. And those RYR1 cases, um, it's been a while since I read the paper, but there are four really well described cases. And I think at least three of the four were recessive cases, which is also very interesting, but helpful for those of you who are trying to figure out what does this variant mean, this variant of unknown significance in RYR1, because the, you know, the, the verified cases of RYR1 plus episodic weakness, most of them were recessive, which is a much rarer event. And if you look at the gene test, and you have a VUS, it might be listed as heterozygous. That means only one copy of it. And that makes it much less likely that this RYR1 variant is responsible for your episodic weakness uh, because they've been, they've been homozygous recessive in the in at least three of the four um, well-established cases. Um, the, it, it turns out that biologically, this RYR1 channel, which is a calcium channel, it's not in the part of the cell that controls electrical excitability. It's in an intracellular compartment that controls calcium release. And so there's only a tenuous secondary relationship between that channel and electrical excitability of the cell. So it's not too surprising to me that we're not finding a lot of bona fide RYR1 pathogenic variants in classical periodic paralysis. Because I think the RYR1 cases are going to be much more these myopathies, so which is kind of a generic term for you know, pathologic change in muscle that isn't working properly. Um, with RYR1 mutations, there can be um, anomalies that are seen on the biopsy. So the muscle biopsy can be very helpful in that case, whereas it's not necessary anymore in periodic paralysis. So it's a different disease, but it has a little bit of overlap in that the weakness can fluctuate. And so, you know, we're still figuring out, and that's why there isn't a classical potassium relationship in my view. So we're, we're nearing the end and we, st we had a huge response, which I'm really happy to see that um, so many people um, joined us today with questions, but unfortunately we're not gonna be able to get to all the questions. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that I did share um, some links on the chat where you can go afterwards and ask questions or to those links to hopefully get information that you have on um, variants of unknown significance or genetic testing. But um, one of the things that I wanted to touch on, because um, a lot of questions come in on this, Dr. Cannon, is peri primary periodic paralysis and secondary periodic paralysis. I'm getting questions about urine, potassium wasting. Can someone with periodic paralysis also um, waste potassium in their urine? Those types of questions. Yeah, this is a, a good topic to touch base on. So primary periodic paralysis is another name for familial periodic paralysis, which means runs in your families due to a gene defect that affects the electrical excitability of the muscle. Those gene defects do not regulate salt balance in the kidney. So individuals with periodic paralysis uh, from the classical uh, gene defects are not at risk for excessive uh, you know, potassium loss in the urine and things like that. Secondary periodic paralysis means you have severe muscle weakness secondary to a problem regulating the salts in your blood, in particular the potassium salt, and that it's too low. And this can come from a primary disease of the kidney, some inherited diseases of the kidney, like uh, 
distal renotubular acidosis or autoimmune diseases like lupus or Sjogren's syndrome or intoxication with diuretics or licorice intoxication, all of these things impact the kidney or you can lose it through the GI tract. Some people who have bypass surgery in the GI tract lose a lot of potassium. But the key thing is in all of these secondary forms, the primary problem is your body is losing a lot of potassium. That's not what's happening in periodic paralysis. In periodic paralysis, the potassium is going to the wrong place. It's moving into the muscle. Now, if you're a patient with periodic paralysis, hypopp, and you're taking a lot of potassium supplement, your body's going to be regulating that and dumping a lot of potassium in the urine intentionally, because otherwise you'll intoxicate yourself on potassium. So you have to be careful interpreting a urine sample from someone with hypopp and say, hey, my urine potassium is high. That's why I have to take so much potassium because hypopp won't let me hold on to it. That's a misconception. You have a lot of potassium in your urine because you're taking a lot of potassium. But the secondary periodic paralysis, another important point is uh, they don't recur, they don't tend to recur over and over again, lifelong, like, like periodic paralysis done. Usually there's something, you have this risk because you have renal tubular acidosis or something, and then it gets a little worse because you're dehydrated or you have the flu and a lot of vomiting or something else. And then these factors overwhelm the system. And in those cases of secondary hypopp, the potassium is usually extraordinarily low, 1.7, 1.5. I mean, really low. You are rushed to the ICU. Not always, but that's what it tends to be. And so um, in, in many cases, especially with, with kidney disease and loss in the urine, the potassium is going to be much lower and consistently lower than hypopp. With, with familial primary hypopp, as many of you know, you go to the emergency room, even with a severe attack of weakness, and sometimes your potassium is normal. And that's part of the disease. In secondary periodic paralysis, that won't be the case. If you're severely weak because of secondary periodic paralysis, your potassium at that moment has to be really, really low. It, it must be. So these are some distinguishing features uh, between the two disorders. And one more question. Um, and I'm hoping this will answer a lot of the common questions in this uh, topic. When you, we have a lot of people who are clinically diagnosed with periodic paralysis that have symptoms of heaviness, um, pain and weakness. Um, there are other conditions though too that could possibly be causing these symptoms um, my fear is always um, if we're focusing on one specific possible diagnosis, we may miss what could be the real cause, right? And if you don't have the correct treatment. So it's important to, for these people um, to understand, right? That not all of these symptoms of excessive weakness, feeling of heaviness or pain um, is going to be periodic paralysis. Is that correct? That's correct. And so, um, as all of us know, weakness or fatigue and muscle pain are relatively common symptoms. Almost everybody at one point in their life experiences that. And so you have the challenge of very common set of symptom cluster and a very, very rare disease, periodic paralysis. Remember, there are probably three or 4,000 individuals in the entire United States who have periodic paralysis, you know, something on the order of one per 100,000. So, you know, just statistically, that's a real challenge in how do you reconcile very common, very common symptoms with one very rare cause. And so you need to have, uh, you need to be careful, you need to be open-minded, and I would encourage this in anyone for whom the clinical diagnosis isn't rock solid or there's not genetic confirmation is that, you know, it's fine to be exploring the possibility of periodic paralysis and using some of those recommendations to try to improve your situation, but don't end your journey. <laughs> keep thinking, keep asking um, and stay open-minded. 
And, um, you know, I'll just put a little editorial out there. You know, I, I started training in medicine in the 80s and it, it was fine. We could put on the insurance form, you know, weakness, unknown, unknown cause. Nowadays, where everything has to have an ICD-9, now ICD-10 code, and, you know, it has to be linked to reimbursement and things like that, there's a lot of pressure for your healthcare provider to list a specific diagnosis. And I think that's a shame because it's, it's, it's prevented people from remaining open-minded and thinking about diagnosis. So you can do that personally and encourage your healthcare team to always keep looking and asking and, and thinking. And, and fortunately in periodic paralysis, there are a lot of uh, very effective approaches that can be taken that don't have high risk associated. Lifestyle changes, dietary changes, uh, simple supplements. And, and so fortunately you can try those and, and, and see if you benefit from that um, without putting yourself at undue risk, but stay open-minded. Well, thank you so much for coming today. And, and, and uh, it was quick, right? That went so <laughs> fast. We were trying so hard to get to so many questions. We had over 60 questions. Um, and I did, I am sending out to everyone that if you were not, if you were not able to get your question answered today, to make sure to sign up for the conference for next weekend, because after you speak and after our other speakers speak, they will have the opportunity to ask questions on Saturday. But then on Sunday, there's two hours of Q and A time for Dr. Cannon and the other doctors on the panel. So hopefully um, you will get your uh, answers then. Um, everybody's saying thank you. And again, Dr. Cannon, thank you so much for today and for everything else that you do for us um, in the PP community. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your stories. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.